So this talk seeks to illuminate the imaginative ways in which Black visual artists and performers of the Caribbean and the United States sought to create art that was representative of their respective milieus in the early 20th century. Tropical Aesthetics of Black Modernism offers an investigation of how Caribbean and American artists of African descent of the early 20th century responded to colonial and hegemonic regimes through visual and performative tropicalist representation. And privilege, it privileges the land and how a sense of place is critical in the identity formation of early 20th century artists, as well as their creative processes. While this book offers ideas about Black modernism that are new to the discipline of art history in particular, it is important to acknowledge its address to studies of Black modernity more broadly. By proposing an alternative understanding of the tropics, this talk shows how Alfredo Lam and Josephine Baker effectively contributed to the development of Black modernity and even Black sonic modernity. My theoretical intervention demonstrates how tropicality calls for a new understanding of the African diasporic experience, a unifying element connecting the Black Atlantic that is not generic, but creates a linkage between this enclave and the land of origin, Africa. This notion of tropicality thus disrupts the construction of Africa as the antithesis of Europe and the embodiment of the past and renders the Pan-African world as a purposeful interlocutor of modern life. This project grapples with the ways in which visual tropes of tropicality complicated the conveyance of modernity for Black people in different locations throughout the Black Atlantic. It examines the creative manifestations of Black modernism in the early 20th century and explicates how tropicality functioned as a key unifying element in African diasporic art. By examining the works of Lamb and Baker in this talk, I will explicate how their representations of tropical and subtropical landscapes are reflective of the unique yet complex relationship that Black people of these respective regions have with the terrain they inhabit. Land on which many of the enslaved of their enslaved ancestors labored. Despite this traumatic legacy, these creative works nonetheless show how this land is revered by its inhabitants, who recognize it for its beauty, with the intention not to transform it but to accept it. This ideological heeding to nature should be viewed as an alternative modernity that counters the idea of transforming undeveloped nature for the sake of capitalist expansion. In doing so, there is a particular political enterprise at stake, one that dissociates the land with the history of slavery and thereby reclaims it. Artists such as Wilfredo Lam and Josephine Baker are thus highlighting the internationalist ethos of Pan-Africanism through their visual and performed explorations of landscapes, terrains that are mostly tropical, and are therefore geopolitically uniting areas such as the southern United States and the Caribbean. Ultimately, this talk seeks to illuminate the desire for early 20th century Black Atlantic peoples to engender a sense of belonging to the citizenry and a particular kind of claim to the land that they inhabit, which speaks to a desire for whom. In The Problem of Nature, David Arnold asserts that tropicality is a form of othering that encapsulates, quote, an ambivalent body of ideas, representations, and experiences, end quote, all of which exists in mental juxtaposition to something else. Or simply stated, tropicality is a social construction rather than a material reality. Historically, when European and European American artists and writers who ventured to tropical zones represented these terrains, their perceptions of the physical arrangements were compounded by projections of values and ideals, as well as certain fears and prejudices. Historian Nancy Lee Stepan reminds us that the word landscape refers to, quote, 
a manner of perceiving space in terms of a scene situated at a distance from the observer that is rooted in a Western way of organizing the visual field and that the designation of a site as one of nature often results in our ignoring the social matrices that frame or produce it or the realities and textures of human activities necessary to make it work as a site of nature, end quote. Indeed, this Western way of perceiving the natural environment of the global South began in the 15th century and persisted well into the 20th century. In his explication of the modernist experience, Edouard Glissant calls for alternative modernisms to be more collective and not singular in their rethinking of these narratives. And he encourages these constructions to embrace the complications that already exist. Quote, they must include all at once struggle, aggressiveness, belonging, lucidity, distrust of self, absolute love, contours of the landscape, emptiness of the cities, victories, and confrontations. This is what I call our eruption into modernity, end quote. This line of inquiry speaks to the importance of recognizing a diversity of experiences in modernism, but in particular, the diverse experiences of Black modernism. As Glissant further elucidates, the human spirit yearns for a cross-cultural relationship without universalist, universalist transcendence. And diversity requires the presence of peoples with the intention of creating a new relationship. With this in mind, it is plausible to discern how early 20th century Black Atlantic artists defied conventional understandings of tropicalia by representing tropical terrains in art and performance in new and radical ways. In the vein of art historians such as Cabina Mursa, Laurie Stokes Sims argues that for Black artists, quote, modernism affirmed the notion that a modern individual could be an agent of change or transformation. Whereas for white artists, modernism was reflected in the breakdown of the representational and the familiar in literature and art. For Black artists, that rupture represented a potential revolution in self-definition and self-image as they assumed the role of proactive rather than reactive agents in contemporary society." End quote. These artists employed what I call tropical aesthetics in an effort to enact the naming of police. Women's studies scholar Kathy McKittrick asserts that such naming, quote, regardless of expressive method and technique, is also a process of self-assertion and humanization, end quote. The tropical aesthetics that these artists and performers use function in this vein, proving to be an aesthetic that makes plausible what McKittrick calls a sayability of geography that enables agency. There is no aspiration for, quote, material ownership and Black repossession, but rather a grammar of liberation, end quote. Tropical aesthetics thus allowed these artists to visually articulate a different way of knowing and imagining the world. Since geography in a material and discursive sense is never fully secure, given that three-dimensional space is socially produced, the idea that belonging to a place could lead to a socio-spatial liberation is seldom realized for many Black people. Due to these limitations, Tropical aesthetics allows for a critical imaging and reclaiming of space. And through art, one can reify social geographies through the manifestation of what McKittrick calls alternative geographic formulations. Indeed, as the artists and performers explored in this book have proven, art can bring into fruition a different sense of place. So I want to just briefly give a sense of the layout of the book. So, um, you know, the first chapter examines the work of the African-American artist Aaron Douglas, 
And in this chapter, I argue that the compositions in which the natural landscapes predominate should not be viewed as a visual rebuttal of modernism, but rather as a Black modernist representation that envisages tropicalia as monumental and integral to early 20th century Black, black self-definition. The second chapter examines the ways in which Rafael Lam and his art encompass the proactive and transformative nature of Black modernism, emphasizing the fundamental purpose of the terrain. So I will be exploring Lam's art in this talk. And the third chapter considers how the performance of an early 20th century Trinidad Carnival offered an immediate means through which the body as a creative force can readily accomplish a direct connection with the terrain and thereby enact a naming of place, therefore functioning as an articulation of Pan-Africanism. In the fourth chapter, I examine the ways in which the stage and screen performances of Josephine Baker and Maya Angelou served as an imperative of the modern era by transforming their predicament, not only through self-reinvention, but also through reorienting their relationship with the physical world. And so I also will be looking at the performances of Baker later in the talk. Upon Lam's return to Cuba in 1941, he became fully preoccupied with the dense natural wildlife of his country. Undoubtedly, it was the natural terrain that prevailed in much of the art he created while on the island. Lam's reinvention of the landscape in his compositions is part of a tradition of self-invention in the Caribbean and is central to a new world aesthetic. Ultimately, this propensity to reinvent a new landscape is in line with creating an empowering historical narrative. Through his art, Lam is re-signifying the tropical landscape as indicative of modernity, while also commemorating the connection that Black Cubans had with the land. In this section, I will reveal how Lamb's reinvention of the landscape was ultimately a prelude to the self-definition of Black humans, Cubans, and ultimately all Black Atlantic peoples aspire to have. I consider how tropical aesthetics can be a useful strategy employed by Lamb to disrupt the touristic gaze, given its potential for inducing agency and imagining new possibilities for one's natural surroundings. In 1941, Lam began a journey that would eventually take him back to Cuba. When he was finally able to escape wartime France, he and a group of friends boarded a ship bound for Martinique. During a six-week stay, Lam befriended Aimé and Suzanne Césaire and René Menil, who had just begun publishing the journal Tropique. Aimé Césaire returned to Martinique with his wife Suzanne in 1939, after pursuing their tertiary education in Paris, and they later launched the journal Tropique. The periodical tackled the history of slavery and predicament, the predicament of colonialism, and it often published articles on natural history, and the intention was to stimulate Antillians to revere their natural environment. For Aimé Césaire, the foundation of a newly defined Black Caribbean subjectivity is situated in the soil, the nucleus of the landscape. And the political, cultural, and spiritual identity of modern Black people is inherently connected to vegetation. For Suzanne Césaire, the plant is the means through which humanity can be redeemed and empowered. In the Césarean ethos, the plant connotes an Africa-derived worldview in which man does not dominate nature, but rather abandons himself to the rhythm of universal life. These ideologies certainly encourage Lam to rediscover his African ancestry once he returned to Cuba. However, Cuban society was generally dismissive of Black Cuban culture, and Black Cubans really spoke openly with whites about their African cultural heritage. Yet by the 1920s, 
The cultural sphere became exemplified by a group of Cuban intellectuals who promoted Afro-Cubanismo as a defining force for Cuban national identity. Cuban modernists championed the Black Cuban masses, as well as their creative forms that lay outside the usual academic and elitist purview. However, their affirming ideologies did not overshadow the social, political, and economic predicament Black Cubans experienced in their everyday lives. And this reality was troubling to Lam and gave him much fodder for his artistic mission. For the artist, returning to Cuba was like returning to his beginnings. With a rapid increase in Cuba's population, the mostly American-owned sugar industry and the collapse of the world's sugar prices had a devastating effect on its citizens who had to contend with the uncertainty of unemployment and underemployment. As a Cuban of African as well as Chinese and Spanish descent, the, deb the debilitating poverty of Black Cubans most certainly was of major significance to Lam. It was therefore imperative that his art became a political weapon that visualized the plight of a subaltern people. The jungle ultimately served that purpose. It is a visually rich composition featuring a tapestry of thick tropical foliage, notably sugarcane stalks, tobacco leaves, and palm leaves. The greenery depicted by Lamb has a striking and animated presence, and its depth and varying textures clearly parallels the imagery seen in the photographs of Lamb's garden, which was a major source of inspiration. The composition defies the Renaissance notion of linear perspective, offering a visual realm that, according to Laurie Stoke Sims, parallels the all over paintings of 1950s New York, where, quote, the sense of a centralized focus was eliminated in favor of an equal distribution of parts to the overall whole, end quote emanating from the foliage of four anthropomorphic beings. Their linear frames echo the verticality of the cane stalks, and their coloring allows for a camouflage effect. Yet their mask-like faces, large bulbous breasts and buttocks, which resemble fruits like papaya, not to mention their large feet and hands, render them as quite distinct. Some arms are outstretched, others akimbo, while the arm of the second figure from the left reaches down to the ground like a foot. The overlapping forms and amalgams of body parts are configured via cubist pictorial arrangements of multiple viewpoints, while the transgression against naturalist representations is certainly an adherence to the surrealist liberties that Lamb employed. Art historian Julia P. Herzberg notes that Lamb began merging the figure with the landscape just before he painted the jungle. Prior to that, there was a fusing of the human form with an array of zoological elements, most notably parts of the horse's body. By 1942, there was a rapid progression in unifying his anthropomorphic forms with leaves and eventually with dense vegetation. One of the many references inherent in the jungle that makes it distinct from other Cuban works is the veneration of Afro-Cuban religion. The figures in the painting can be interpreted as what art historian Edward Lucy Smith describes as a Santeria procession. Santeria is the syncretic religion of Cuba that combines both Yoruba religious ideologies and Roman Catholicism. In the jungle, Santeria deities meander through and blend with the tall stalks of sugarcane and tobacco leaves. In fact, Lam was the first modernist artist in Cuba to visually explore African-derived religion in art. Another Black religious form of Cuba called Palomonte is also thematically relevant to this composition. Dense, untilled botanical areas, the Monte, where religious ceremonies take place, are often considered to be sacred. It is believed that Orishas, Yoruba deities of the Santeria religion, are invoked in these 
pieces, thereby allowing the sacred to come into the space. This is also the site where the priests and priestesses gather necessary plants for rites that support the well being of their devotees. Palomonte is even more significant here, particularly since the word Monte is included in its name, and Monte is the sacred space. Related to religious practices from the pre colonial kingdom of Congo in Central Africa, the word Palo means a segment of wood while Monte refers to a forested area that is sacred, as well as a rural stronghold. Lam astutely captured the sacredness of the landscape with his rich, selective color palette. Another characteristic that makes the jungle viscerally in tandem with the African continuum that exists in Cuba is the masquerade-like qualities endemic and the anthropomorphic forms. Their bodies seem to slither through the cane and tobacco-filled terrain, and their placement in the foreground is commanding in such a way that recalls revelers asserting themselves in the public sphere during one of Cuba's masquerading traditions. Structurally, the jungle echoes Federico Miale's Day of the Magi with its vi vibrant and masquerading figures occupying the foreground, most notably the six figures at the very front. At best, the collective emergence of Lam's figures from the vegetation encourages one to think of a transgressive, of the transgressive possibilities of the carnivalesque and the eminence of this cultural form to people of African descent in Cuba. This transgression permeates through the monumental anthropomorphic figures that crowd the foreground, creating spatial tension. There is also a great sense of dynamism in the push and pull effect of the large forms, given the large feet and hands that press downward and push upward, generating a sense of movement in different directions that is pervasive in the gaiety of carnival. Such spatial tension generated from every section of the composition, along with the representation of crops associated with slavery and colonialism, signify a horrid legacy of exploitation and oppression. Yet it also highlights the counter histories of resistance and revival embedded in the counter ideologies of Black Cuban culture. In keeping with this idea of subversion, the jungle articulates a political imperative. Lam is clearly making a choice to feature the landscape rather than the urbanity found in many of Cuba's metropolitan centers. He explained that the painting was intended to communicate a psychic state. Lam expressed that he wanted to, quote, represent the spirit of the Negroes in the situation in which they were then. I have used poetry to show the reality of acceptance and protest, end quote. For him, the word jungle aptly captured this reality. Etymologically, the word jungle was adapted from the Sanskrit word jangala in an effort to convey environmental differences between Europe and tropical localities. Jangala, which, which is translated to mean tangled thicket, was gradually distorted from its original culturally specific meaning. By 1813, it became Django, which was defined as a wood or thicket, a country overrun with wood or long grass in a rude and uncultivated state. Eventually, Django became jungle, which denoted the dense, tangled and menacing vegetation representative of tropical nature that stood in stark contrast to the orderliness of temperate woodlands. Jungle as a construct thus became universalized to signify all dense forests of the tropical world and augmented the established notion that a lack of organization and coherence in the physical environment is directly connected to a lack of organization and coherence amongst its inhabitants. Lam was keenly aware of this signification and of how the word connoted a place of threats, of aggressions, of perils known and unknown. He also recognized how relevant this word was during this historical moment when Cuban artists and writers acknowledged the landscape 
along with the mulata, as a symbol of cultural nationalism. Yet although there is no jungle in Cuba, as Lam rightly stated, but rather woods, hills, and open country, the artist's decision to use the word jungle to epitomize the current state of affairs for Afro-Cubans is clever since he is usurping a Western construct of the tropics in a satirical way to visually convey a socioeconomic predicament of Black Cubans that was the result of Western institutions of slavery and colonialism. But it should also be noted that his friend, uh, the anthropologist, the Cuban anthropologist Lydia Cabrera, she often titled much of the works he created in Cuba, but there may have been, you know, certainly have been some collaboration between the two of them when it came to titling his artworks. So such an employment of the term is astute as it also provides complex commentary on the Western construct of, the tro of tropicality and its association with the black body. Using the aesthetic rubric of modernism, Lamb's art makes it possible for the viewer to recognize the ways in which the Black masses relate to their environment. Through the practice of a grammar of liberation, Lamb's art allows for the naming of place that makes self-assertion and self-definition possible. Lamb's signature piece commemorates the many challenges Black Cubans endured up until the artist's return. The jungle celebrates its, their perseverance while sim simultaneously rejecting any pretense as to who the land belongs to, serving as a gesture of reclamation for land that was mostly owned by American companies and used for the capitalist prosperity of the US. Undoubtedly, this painting encompasses the revolutionary spirit of Black modernism, given Lamb's bold reinterpretation of the Cuban landscape, while also emphasizing the resolute character of the Black masses. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, the Josephine paper section. All right, so integral to understanding the ways in which tropical aesthetics are present in exoticized performances of the early 20th century is the consideration of how corporeal expressions of Black performers are enduringly connected to the making of space and claiming a kind of geographic sovereignty. Much in the same way cabarets and music halls inco incorporated jungle deco into their furnishings to invoke the, tr the primitive, I argue in this section that Black performers in turn exploited the tropical artifice to ritualistically engender a likeness to Black autonomy on stage or in song. This speaks to an association of the tropics with a homeland to which one belongs. Indeed, how one experiences race and space in the modern world is negotiated by bodies in motion. And in the early 20th century, as Gina Brown asserts, quote, dance was the lexicon reflecting the dialectic process of modern transformation, the modern body continually reinventing itself in and against its environment, at the same time as the environment made its claim upon the body. End quote. Through song and dance, Black performers practice an imperative of the modern era by transforming their predicament not only through self reinvention, but also through reorienting their relationship with the physical world. The defiant dancing and singing body worked to, to challenge geographies of domination and its eclipsing of Black women's geographies functioning against a world that regarded Black populations as ungeographic. This is evident in the acts of Josephine Baker. In particular, it resonates in her performances of the famed La Revue Negre at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées and later in La Folie du Jour at the Folie Bergère, both in 1920s Paris. Yet the performances were meant to cater to the escapist desires of the sophisticated Parisian that were deep rooted in colonialist and exoticist indoctrination. These productions 
productions followed the precedent of popular shows featured in the cabarets and nightclubs of early 20th century New York. Baker was discovered by the creator of La Revue Negre, Carolyn Dudley Reagan, in one such venue, the Plantation Club of Midtown Manhattan. Frequented by after theater members of the Cafe Society, like the Cotton Club in Harlem, the Plantation Club bore a name that intimated the antebellum South. The owners intended for the power structure of that era to be replicated with carefree Black and employees catering to every need of the white patrons. Like the featured performances, the decor incorporated furnishings that invoked the primitive and was often referred to as jungle decor. The Cotton Club, for instance, had artificial palm trees, a plantation facade, while the elegant furniture, fixtures, draperies, and tablecloths were reminiscent of the big house and a southern plantation. Explicitly implicated in these environments are the impressions of transatlantic slavery, which leak into the future, in essence, recycling the displacement of difference. While these environments draw from traditional geographic arrangements, one can see how the cabarets and later the music halls of Paris not only simulated the social and racial order of slavery, but also implicated the geography, landscape, and spatial arrangements essential for the institution of slavery. Premiering in 1925 with 25 musicians and artists, La Revue Neg aspired to become the first major vaudeville style production that truly represented Black expressive cultures around the world. With a lineup that included a melange of different cultural offerings, ranging from the Dixieland music of the American South to an authentic African performance titled Dance des Sauvages, the intent was to feature a bill that incorporated the many cultural manifestations attributed to Black people. The review consisted of seven acts, Mississippi Stream Steamboat Race, New York Skyscraper, Louisiana Camp Meeting, Les Strutting Babies, Darky Impressions, Les Pieds Qui Parlent, and Charleston Cabaret. And each act stereotypically highlighted a trait often associated with the soul of Black people, idleness, melancholy, religious fervor, and sexual ecstasy. Particularly interesting is the invocation of locality in the names of most of the seven acts. They are named after places like Louisiana and Charleston that have long histories of slavery and colonialist oppression. And more importantly, in locations that are situated within the tropical and subtropical zones of the world. The set designs, costuming, musical accompaniment, and choreography of the performances all worked in concert to illuminate the supposed inherent linkage between Black bodies and the tropical zone. It is clear in the conceptualization of the review that the idea of the tropics serves to conjure a hot zone, referring to climate, character, sexuality, and even food, which would consolidate the borders of Europeanness and whiteness. The costuming evoked visual markers that codify Black bodies as destitute, indolent, and even impulsive, highly sexual, and exoticized beings. Such a tropical inspired sensibility characterized the jungle themed jazz performances one would have seen at clubs, cabarets, and music halls in 1920s Harlem. The Black Mecca of New York became the site of glamorized otherness, where white patrons went to experience the easily exploited fantasy of tropical sensuality and savage release. White trade clubs, such as the Plantation Club, the Cotton Club, and Connie's Inn, most of which were located in a strip in Harlem, eventually garnered the name Jungle Alley. <laughs> 
offering an opportunity to experience an iteration of the jungle without losing one's white civility. Carolyn Dudley, the creator of the review, would have been well aware of this trend and would have played a key role in incorporating the concept into Lab Review Net, thereby being instrumental in exporting this cultural phenomenon to Europe. The notion of the tropics as a hot and torrid zone is what the Parisian audiences reacted to upon seeing Josephine Baker and Joe Alex perform their act, Dance des Sauvages, in La Revue Negre. The reviews for choreographer decided that this nude performance by Josephine would give the production the erotic edge it needed at a climactic moment, and Baker conceded to this request. The sexually charged performance closed the show and featured Baker and Alex in revealing costumes, with Baker wearing a feather miniskirt and feathers on her wrists and ankles. The dance gave emphasis to the hypersexualization prescribed to Black people, with the conveyance of tropical Africa and the various elements of the production all serving to strengthen this representation. The performance consisted of acrobatic bodily movements with the accompaniment of a polyrhythmic arrangement by the drummer. There were also corporeal expressions akin to the belly dance that featured moves such as the shake, the shimmy, the mess around, popular dances of the, ja of the jazz age in 1920s New York. All in all, it is impossible not to recognize the allusions to the jungle that characterize the conceptualization of Blackness in the Western imaginary of the early 20th century. And Baker's contrasting public image of the stage undoubtedly signifies an embodiment of Black modernity. And when she incorporated the opposing sides of her image into her act, this thwarted any possibilities of audience misconception. Remnants of her offstage persona are evident on the cover of the La Folie du Jour album from 1926. A gleaming baker is pictured with her hair coiffed in her signature hairstyle and decked in chandelier earrings, an elaborate pearl necklace and bracelets. While she is bare chested, which was typical of Folie Berger female performers of the time, her costume primarily consists of large aqua blue feather plumes. This image captures the Black modernity inherent in her oeuvre, not to mention it exhibits how adept she was in fitting the calculated incongruity between her two sides into her act to maximize its exposure. Since the enterprise of, of constructing Baker's imagery as a tropicalized other was rooted in a specific geographic location, which is entrenched in France's long-standing involvement in slavery and colonialism, costumes such as the famed banana skirt certainly emblematize tropicality. Originally conceived by the French writer Jean Cou the writers Jean Cocteau and Paul Collet, Baker first wore the skirt early in her career, starting in the production La Folie du Jour in 1926, at the Folie Berger and appeared in other iterations of it over the next 10 years. Folie Berger offered his patrons escapist spectacles, deeply ensconced in orientalist forms of exotica, and the lavish extravaganzas were accented by extravagant decor of North African derivation that included luxuriant green plants and even a Turkish bath. The set design for La Folie du Jour consisted of a dramatic view of thick tropical foliage with a large uprooted tree overrun with vines and moss, taking up much of the middle ground as it is lying on its side. The small portrayal of Baker can be seen playfully running along the tree's trunk, but also trying to avoid falling into the body of water that flows beneath it. Just along the top foreground of the image, are detailed renderings of leaves of various tropical plants, conveyed in such a way so as to extend the facsimile of tropicalia onto the stage. The tone of the colors is quite dark and it mirrors the dark colors used to render the other human figures depicted in the lower foreground of the image. 
Seven figures could be seen either sitting or reclining on the ground, six of them of African descent looking straight towards the viewer, or the lone white male figure wearing a pith helmet appears to be sleeping in a makeshift, makeshift, makeshift tent. This vista not only exemplifies French colonial conquest in Africa, but it also characterizes the future colonial subjects as complicit to the colonialist project. The jungle spectacle of La Folie du Jour began with two black male drummers decked in loincloths positioned underneath a palm tree. While beating their drums, Baker slowly reveals each limb and eventually her torso as she descends from a tree. She then proceeds to present her erotic repertoire of movements in a performance that actively engages with the backdrop discussed earlier. In the second act, she wore gold bracelets, beaded necklaces, and a collection of realistic looking bananas fastened around a waistband. She then performed popular dances like the Charleston and the Black Bottom. The emphasis, however, lay on undulating pelvic movements. And as Baker explained, the banana skirt coat slung low around my hips to accentuate my forward and, black and backward movements, end quote. Although the multiple phalli of the skirt at once signify the dichotomy of the effeminization of the black male to castration and alternatively his inherent hypermasculinization, her performance successfully emphasizes an appropriation of masculinity while also challenging heteronormativity. One can even recognize the artistic cannibalism inherent in Baker's performance. In addition, Baker's black body, accentuated by the banana skirt, provides an example of the tropics biting back to the disruption of the power dynamics of, at play. Rather than accept the pejorative value assigned to tropicality by European thought, tropical aesthetics allows us to think differently about how Baker exercised artistic cannibalism in an effort to consume reductive significations, such as disparaging the tropical landscape and its association with the fetishized Black body. Her performances could be viewed as fully engaged in recontextualizing these values in a way that is transformative, since it turns the colonial and imperialist logic of the fetishized Black body on its head. Furthermore, when considering the set design for La Folie du Jour, one can acknowledge how this replicated terrain conjures the idea of Africa as a homeland that connected Black people of all nationalities, like those living in Paris, and signifies the possibility of Black sovereignty. This surreptitious ode to Africa reinstates the truth that all African descended people in and out of the continent persistently engage in modern life. The popular dances Baker sampled during her performances proved to be just as effective in demystifying the Black body's relation with tropical and subtropical landscapes. Most, if not all, of the popular dances that Baker appropriated in her performances were rooted in long standing traditions during the 18th and 19th centuries of enslaved African Americans parodying the music and dancing of their white masters. An immensely popular dance in France, the cakewalk was originally a plantation harvest dance that combined the European quadrille with strutting imitations of the planter's class. The Charleston lampooned the square dances of the planter's class, in addition to Africanizing and reconceptualizing the quadrille. What is fascinating about this early 20th century popular dance is that it is named after a city that was the epicenter for the American institution of slavery. As literary scholar Michael Bushuk argues, in the spirit of slaves parodying the dances and actions of their masters, the Charleston does not highlight the, quote, failure for the Black performer to emulate the innate grace of whites, but rather the performer's movements instead exaggerate white sophistication itself 
as affected instead of inherent, end quote. Josephine Baker continued this tradition in her performances by expanding on the parodying of white affectations that ultimately called into question the notion of white superiority. Indeed, the transformation of the French music hall into the ungeographic domain of the jungle via the sound of jazz music, the jungle imagery of the set design, and the frenzy dancing of Black performers all worked in concert to bring into fruition the world of mythic Black primitivism. Every night, the music hall Les Champs-Élysées essentially became a simulated version of the imagined primitivist Africa and Southern United States. There is something carnivalesque and parodying about these jungle spectacles, especially since Paris was a Black trans nation all its own. While performers adhere to the desired misrepresentations of Blackness that the white audiences wanted to see, after quit and call, they would go to neighborhoods like Montmartre and Montparnasse, where Black modernity was fully practiced and embodied. By the 1920s, the number of Black entertainers traveling from the US increased significantly, and there were also performers coming from the Caribbean, Latin America, and Africa. Through his restructuring of modernist aesthetics in his own terms, Wilfredo Lam became an insistent and persevering force within the Western art world, thereby transforming the canon into one that is global. His art conjured a world that was decidedly Caribbean, using the Western pictorial tradition as a point of departure. His art pursued the Herculean endeavor of galvanizing the Black masses of the Caribbean to what the idea of belonging to a police is based on a struggle for socio-spatial liberation. The pursuit of this venture is often never, never fully realized, yet the art of Alfredo Lam offers alternative geographic formulations, a particular rendering of a different sense of place. Similarly, through ritualized embodiments of tropicalia, Josephine Baker's dynamic and provocative bodily expressions generated a symbolic, the symbolic sovereignty of Pan-Africa, an affinity many early 20th century Blacks necessitated. Indeed, Baker performed constructions of Blackness and Black otherness that she did not ultimately control. Such conundrums in the experiences of early 20th century Black performers are constant reminders that, as Stephanie Lee Batiste asserts, quote, ideologies of power rooted in hierarchy and racism can at times coexist with agendas to assert racial equality and Black humanity, even as the very terms of representation and insist upon the opposite, end quote. Ultimately, shifts inevitably occurred in the way Black people molded their identities, insisting that one developed a strong sense of place in this endeavor. Thank you.